Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Stas Grinberg, who is the co-founder of Vision and Beyond. Stas, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome. I'm excited to learn from you what you're doing in the industry. And um, I always like when I hear names of companies because it kind of gives you like a peek into uh, what their vision is. And I love vision and beyond because it's not just the vision, it's beyond the vision. It's it's like talking about the transformation, what's in the future. So I'm excited to see what you guys are doing, but give us your story. What is your background and how did you get into your industry? Yeah, so me and my partner, Peter, were childhood friends. We served in the army together as combat officers in the IDF. Started investing in uh, real estate while doing that. Uh, We started investing in the U.S. real estate market because we didn't believe in the Israeli market at the time. And uh, we have done it from distance from syndicators that are doing it from out of country with a lot of uh, local partners, but it had uh, prices that we had to pay in, all, in order to learn in our journey. And around 2018, we decided that we want to do it the right way, the real way. And we built the company pretty much from the ground up. And uh, We moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, started driving a car with two binders and a printer and uh, finding uh, deals and then finding the people to help us to manage them, to renovate them. And we were buying the worst properties in Cincinnati, very aggressive renovations. And uh, over time, we started buying larger and larger properties. And today we manage 3,100 units in four states uh, in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and in Texas. Wow. So I was wondering when you were in the military together, at what point did you think, let's do real estate? Because that's a whole different mindset, isn't it? Yeah, it's 100% a different mindset, but sometimes over weekends, you have time to think about the future and you see that as a military officer, you do have some salaries, but you don't have time to spend it. Yeah. And uh, uh, you begin to have some savings. and. You're wondering what you're going to do with it because you understand that just by uh, having savings, you're not going to make a future. Yeah. Uh, you need something more significant. And uh, we were looking for that route. Excellent. I love I love that because that kind of ties into the beyond aspect of your company. You had a vision, but then beyond that was what can we be doing next? So your company now focuses on purchasing uh, properties, do you just buy them for your own portfolio and manage them? Or do you buy for other people? What is your um, what is the problem that you're solving in the industry? I think there are a few problems. One uh, is we're buying it together with investors. Okay. We are investing in every deal, but we have investors that support us that the problem we solve for them is the the ability to put their money to work yet they have their own professions, their own lives, and they don't want to do real estate full time, but they're able to do that with a partner like us who will do all the groundwork for them, who will find the right deals, who who will evaluate, who will manage, who will renovate, and eventually will split the proceeds with them. So for them, that's the problem we're solving. For for tenants, we're providing uh, honorable uh, places of living and we're buying distressed assets and we are improving them and we are giving people uh, proper accommodations to to live and uh, we're doing it we're doing it with a lot of workforce housing so uh, we're doing it for the people that cannot necessarily fight for themselves and uh, we're solving that problem for them and for uh, the cities we're operating because there is huge shortage of housing and uh, we are able to uh, save those properties by properly maintaining them uh, while there is a lot of old product that is being 
mismanaged and therefore sometimes it goes uh, to demolition. You know, a lot of times you hear in business, if you can create a win-win opportunity, then that's a wonderful uh, scenario. But what you just described is a win-win-win because the problem you're solving for investors is, and then the problem you're solving for people that need good housing is, but then there's another benefit is to the city that you're in because you're helping them with redevelopment and that helps the the uh, you know, redesigning the city because you're bettering where people are living. Maybe they're giving you some helpful, you know, incentives, things like that. But there are a lot of benefits there. And when you bring all that together with your knowledge and you synthesize your expertise with that, boy, that truly is a win win win. Yeah, I believe so. That's what they're trying to achieve. So what are you doing when you, you've got 3,100 units, apartment units, when you get ready to make your next acquisition, what is the process you go through with due diligence to evaluate a potential acquisition target? So it's a pretty complex uh, process, even though People like to believe that real estate is simple and, and smooth and easy, and that's how this industry is described. And therefore, a lot of people are going towards the industry. But in reality, to really do due diligence properly, it's a complicated process. There is the physical condition evaluation of every property, which has uh, complex aspects from uh, roofing, plumbing, electric, uh, previous past maintenance, and sometimes in existing properties, it's more complicated than in new construction because in new construction, you just plan and execute and it has its own complications. But in existing assets, you don't, you can't always evaluate all the way the physical condition. And then, but you're doing your best. And then uh, on the financial aspect, due diligence, it's how this property is performed because multifamily complexes are. Uh, each asset is like a small company. It is valued commercially by uh, what it's producing, by its uh, net income. And uh, therefore, there's a piece of financial due diligence. There's understanding of the management piece of it. How did it run so far? What is the delinquency? What are the problems with the tenants? What are the tenants complaining about? Who is on a lease? Who is not on a lease? Who is... Uh, how do you not buy a property today that is occupied 70%, but then uh, two months after it goes uh, it goes down to 40%, or maybe 50% of the tenants are not paying and you don't know that. So all of those pieces are pieces you're trying to evaluate. And if you miss calculate on any one or two of those pieces, it sure would make the deal look a whole lot different, I bet. And you've probably learned some lessons the hard way, right? 100%. I've learned very, uh, uh, quite a lot of painful lessons where I have miscalculated not once and not twice. And But that's what experience is for. You yes. learn a painful lesson and then you try not to repeat it again. So what's one of the lessons that you can remember where you were thinking that it was going to turn out one way, but it didn't, you learned the lesson and then the next project you implemented the solution and then it fixed that problem. I think there were plenty. One was with uh, expectations of physical value where I bought properties with the uh, 20 years guarantees for, for the roofing solution. And the seller actually presented me those guarantees, but those guarantees were not really enforceable. And uh, that was one painful lesson. And then you're just evaluating the, the, the physical condition as is, and you're not relying on past guarantees. And it's something that you need to value the product as, as you believe it is. Uh, we have... There's one very significant lesson that is on the financial piece. When you're buying properties, a lot of the times there is an accounting. Uh, the the it's called the gap. It's the general accounting accepted principles where a lot of the sellers are providing you accounting 
documents that are not showing you the true financials of the property. They are showing you the financial condition, not uh, calculating delinquency, not calculating. Uh, it's calculating like every tenant is paying at all times. And uh, it's ca calculating the potential income instead of the actual in-place income. And that is something we made a huge mistake with and bought a property without understanding that deeply. And I still think that in the industry, there is a lot of buyers and sellers that are not fully understanding how uh, sometimes uh, sellers of properties are playing with the numbers uh, to present a brighter picture than it actually is. And therefore, you're buying a property and yeah. possibly overpaying and possibly are you're not prepared for the for the true value add process that it takes. And you have to go off budget to correct that. And if you were just a professional making great money, have some money to invest, wanted to get into real estate because you read a book and you tried to get into real estate, that's a easy mistake that could be made because you are thrown a bunch of papers or Excel files or documents and it looks good to you. How were you, are you supposed to know that? So that's one of those problems you're solving for the investor to say, look, I've been in the trenches. I've been there, done that, learned the lessons, come alongside us. We're investing in this property as well. So it's not you just saying, here's an investment opportunity. Give me money. It's you saying, we are putting our money in with you. Here's a great uh, project. And so I think that really stands uh, to be a strong value proposition. Exactly. So what you are, um, you're, are you mostly buying duplexes and apartment buildings and things like that? Or, or do you uh, find that the market will fluctuate from time to time where you'll buy a series of uh, single family residents or do you stick mostly with multifamily uh, units? So bo both options are correct. We are, we're buying only multifamily complexes, only properties of over a hundred units. Uh, between 100 and 450, that's, that's our investment strategy currently. But the market does fluctuate, and currently we're living through a market crisis situation, which it's a multiple crisis situation. It's not just the interest rate crisis, but it's also prices of operational expenses and insurance prices that are going through the roof and, and other challenges. So we didn't buy a property for the last eight months just because we're not, we're waiting for the right time. We're not going to buy it uh, if we are uh, not, uh, if we're not believing in the deal. And currently the market is shifting and it's kind of like shooting at a moving target. We believe yeah. we're going to go back to acquisitions at the end of Q2 of this year, beginning of Q3. And uh, that's where we're headed. And the market currently in a, is in a situation where Sellers did not yet fully accept the crisis and reflect the uh, the new numbers into the new prices. It's it's hard psychologically in the real estate industry to uh, reflect new prices as soon as the market is going down. It takes time and it takes some playing, extend and pretend for sellers to try to act like everything is okay and. They are not going to budge and sell properties for cheaper, but that's the new reality, and uh, and uh, the market will have to accept it because the pressure is rising. Yeah, and and the struggle is always not to react quickly, one way or the other. You know, to give it time to just kind of settle in. So, what do you find that you're able to do to notice these trends? How do you stay up to date on the on the market that you're in? Yeah, so number one, there is an ability to learn and and understand the data and what transactions are happening. Number two, there is there are ways to be creative to understand and who are the sellers that will be more pressured to sell than other sellers, uh, especially it influenced by their loan conditions and uh, and uh, just follow closely and leave the market and keep uh, building a, a good reputation in the markets we operate at, at and uh, work with the lenders that we are 
operating with because the lenders know that we operate our properties well. They know that we are trustworthy and they know that if someone, we already had communications with all of our lenders that if someone will in our industry, in our area, uh, in the areas we're strong at, if someone will have a problem of paying his mortgage, that we could be a good uh, sponsor to come in and uh, and uh, and buy the the seller out. Yeah, take over that uh, paper. Yeah. So, in the areas that you're in, in maybe Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, where you're investing in Texas, um, do you find that you? Uh, have liaisons and network with some of the offices of economic development and they're able to help you with some good real-time data and then maybe also on the other hand are you finding that you're able to kind of be a great resource to them and so it's a it's a, a great relationship that way it seems like yes it's always a mutual relationship and you're trying to build it as much as you can and uh also we're looking into the new york market as an interesting market to penetrate because New York specifically has been in a housing crisis for the last several years. And uh, it's different from all of the rest of the economy because the crisis in New York started in 2017 and 18 with increasing tenant, uh, uh, pro-tenant regulations that really, really hurt the housing value. And then while the people believe that it's going to become better, the, the property owners then they got the COVID really, really hard. It slammed New York worse than other places. And then as soon as people started coming back to New York after the COVID, then now we have the financial crisis. So New York has been in, in financial crisis in the housing industry for the last six years. Therefore, we, we're seeing opportunities to buy apartments uh, that were bought in 2017 for $350,000 a unit. We're seeing them as a as a possibility to buy them for a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars a unit, wow. and we we think it's a historical low, and we think that New York will always be the financial center of the world, and it has uh, phases and it has cycles, and now it's on the bottom of the cycle. So that's where we're focusing a lot of our focus now. Excellent. So in in some of these areas, uh, the different states, you had mentioned, um, you know, regulations that change and that constricts then some of the housing. What are you seeing trend wise moving forward in the future? You know, just like your your company name, you know, vision and beyond. What are you seeing beyond? What's the vision you're seeing beyond? Um, where should the housing markets go in specific areas? So I think, number one, the housing the housing market will take a hit, especially on older properties on type B and type C product. It will take a hit and uh, the prices will cut by 30 to 60% in the next 12 to 24 months. And uh, I think that eventually it's going to recover and it's just going to be a cycle situation because there's a true, true uh, need for housing. There's a huge shortage of housing. There is as a result of this crisis, there's going to be a slowdown of new construction, which today there is a shortage of 7 million apartments in the U.S. And uh, after the shortage, uh, after the slowdown in new construction that will hit the market for the next five years, I think the prices will skyrocket. And uh, I think that the New York market will eventually recover because the extreme regulations that are in place that don't seem too optimistic right now will have eventually to change because it influences the city for the worse and it creates tremendous shortage mm. of housing. And there are apartments because it's not even uh, worth it to renovate some buildings. There's a lot of buildings that are going to demolition. And I think that uh, eventually the regulation will uh, swing from it's not necessarily from one side to another side, but it's going to. Uh, get back uh, to a more reasonable regulation. You know, it's it's so interesting when you get that deep and explain it that well, that it, it is so beyond what any real estate investor would typically think. They go to a weekend course and say, here's how to invest in real estate. 
they would scratch the surface. So for someone listening into this, whether they're an investor wanting to get into some of the things you're doing in your projects, but not have all of the headache, um, or maybe even, you know, maybe there's a city official listening in saying, hey, there's some uh, collaboration we would love to talk to you about. What's the best way they can learn more about what you guys are doing and then also reach out and connect with you, Stas? Yeah, so the two main ways would be the company website, which is vnbinvest.com or my personal LinkedIn at Stas Greenberg. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. It was a real pleasure talking with you and learning how you're uh, serving your clients. Thank you, Mike. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.